in a very weird stage of knowledge right now. I'm very heavy into the MLM community. I actually don't like MLMs. I think they're scammy. I thought they were scammy before the whole anti-MLM movement came out like years ago. I always thought they were scammy. You know, if it looks like a scam and it walks like a scam, it's probably a scam. Don't come for me, huns. A lot of people refer to MLMs as pyramid schemes. By the way, if I've learned anything from watching these videos, all of this is just my own opinion. Okay, calm down. It's just my opinion. They're technically not pyramid schemes, right? But that word always comes into play because of the business model and, you know, just like the scammy type atmosphere. And ugh. anyways, it just gives me like the ick. Me being the usual me. I started Googling and I'm like, where did these come from? Like who started this whole business model? Who started MLMs? Who started pyramid schemes? I didn't dig deep enough in to see if the two were connected one way or another, but I did start focusing more on pyramid schemes more because to be honest, they're just like so fascinating to me. I'm like, how do people get involved in pyramid schemes? That's what I want to know. So the MLM is just a little preface to how I got to today's story. So we're not going to talk about MLMs today. Maybe we could just do like a little history of how they got started. That would be cool. You know, just a little like a touch on where they came from. Today we're talking about pyramid schemes. This story is about the ultimate swindler. He is actually known as the ultimate swindler of all time. List it down here. He has a very long, it's like five names. I'm not Italian. I can't pronounce. I mean, I probably could try to pronounce it. But I'm not going to do it justice. Let's go by what he's known as today as Charles Ponzi. And have you heard of a Ponzi scheme? Charles Ponzi, he was an Italian gentleman who came over to the U.S. He operated a lot in the U.S. and in Canada. However, he came over as an immigrant from Italy. He was born March 3rd, 1882. So this happened in like the early 1900s to like the 20s, you know, that kind of era. It's said that he actually came from a very well-to-do family. Like he came from money, his mom came from money, his ancestors were very, very well off. Eventually they hit hard times and I don't know if they lost all their money or if they were just having money issues. From what I read, it seemed that they were just having money issues and they had just hard time. Now it also seems like he kind of wanted to live that very like celebrity lifestyle. He had a lot of rich friends, so he wanted to live the life that they were living. He actually started working at his local post office and you know, I'm sure that his friends were probably like, really? a mailman I don't know if he was a mailman but I can only imagine what these snobby snobs he used to hang out with would say about him like did you see Charles he works at the post office <laughs> just kidding there's nothing wrong with working at a post office it's a hard job interesting fact his friends uh, when they were all college age they there was this university let me look it up I can't remember the name of it University of Rome La Spienza he actually ends up going to that university because all of his friends went there. His friends actually considered the university to be a four year vacation. That's what I read online, was that it was just like a vacation. They would go out to bars, they would go to like fancy dinners, and they would go to the opera, and they would just spend all their money. So he's got all these rich friends who probably they came from like money, you know, like wealth. And here's Ponzi, a humble, postal worker and basically he wanted to live the life of all of his friends he just followed them around he did whatever the hell they did and he blew all his money because he didn't really have that kind of money to spend he's trying to live that high life and it's like you're trying to live above your means you just can't live above your means you know it's just if you have this amount of money you can't spend this amount of money you know because you don't have it so anyways Okay, so he blows all of his money. He didn't even end up getting his degree. Yeah, so basically he went to college <laughs> for nothing. So a lot of people are going to the US right now. They wanted to live in the land of the free. So he goes to the US in 1903. I guess whenever he gets his little moment of fame, he used to always say this. This is like a very, I read this on multiple websites that he used to say this like famous saying, okay? And it's that he came to America with 250 in his pocket. So basically he came with no money. Now in today's money, I think that's equivalent to like, I looked it up and I don't remember exactly how much. It was around like $100. So imagine you're coming from another country, 
you've got a hundred bucks in your pocket. It, it's not a lot, okay? You can't pay rent with that. He had more money, but he actually gambled it all away. So yeah, he's just making one bad decision after another. He's not making good choices. He actually took a bunch of odd jobs up and down the East Coast. I think I read Connecticut, can't remember, but kind of just up and down the whole East Coast. He did dishwashing, he worked in restaurants, he did a couple of odd jobs here and there. He was actually fired from quite a few of them because he used to shortchange customers, he used to steal from his employer, and he's just like not doing great things. Also, what I think is funny is it seemed like he was really determined because it said that he learned English like really quickly like this like he picked it up like that so he seems like one of those people that he's the type that you can do anything you put your mind to we're a couple years later it's been about five years and Ponzi's not doing so hot he probably I imagine built up a bit of a reputation I'm sure word traveled by mouth fairly quickly that he was a swindler and he could not be trusted, which is why he probably bounced around the East Coast so much. Again, I'm not sure. This is just what I think. So he ends up moving to Canada. He moved to Montreal in 1907. And there he becomes an assistant bank. I think it was an assistant bank teller. The bank was called Blanco Zarasi. I'm probably mispronouncing it. But anyway, what else could be better for him than working at a bank where he has all access to money everywhere. I guess that's why he went to a different country. This is basically his jumpstart into like the scheming world and like where the plot thickens a little because this is where he sees his first scam. I guess there was a lot of like real estate loans that went really bad. Uh, people weren't paying their loans back and so basically this, this is causing the bank to start to go under. He actually learns that his boss is doing an, his own little scheme himself and I think this is kind of what implanted the idea in his head eventually later on down the line so I'm actually gonna read to you from the website what his boss is doing because I don't want to butcher the words I don't want to mess anything up so I'm just gonna read to you what he actually did the founder of the bank his name is Luigi uh, Luigi attempted to remain afloat by funding the interest payments using customer deposits from newly opened accounts. He was funding the interest payments not through profit and investment, but using money deposited into newly opened accounts, and was paying 6% interest on bank deposits, which was double the going rate at the time. Okay, so the bank's failing. Luigi actually flees the country. He takes whatever is left in the bank. He flees the country. He says, fuck this, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. He has like a whole family, by the way, too wife and kids he goes by and dips he takes the rest of the money and he actually goes to Mexico I know some man huh I can't imagine if my husband did that to me Luigi's out of the picture Ponzi swoops in and starts living with his family I couldn't find anything if him and Luigi's wife actually started a relationship I don't know about that it is said that uh, Ponzi is very charismatic. He was a talker. He, like, everybody loved this guy. He was super, super charming. So I don't know if he just swindled his way in with Luigi's family. I'm not really sure. I don't know. I couldn't find any information on that. His wife was probably hurting and she needed a rebound. Can you blame her? It just seemed like Ponzi took advantage of people. And I feel really sad for Luigi's wife because... Could you imagine the heartbreak she was probably going through? And this was also during a time where women didn't work. It was very common for women to stay home and raise their family. So I can only imagine that her husband left her and took all their money. This guy comes in and acts as like your saving grace. When in reality, he was probably just using her for a place to live. It's kind of fucked up, you know, but there are people like that unfortunately so yeah it said that he actually moves into their house and he starts helping Luigi's wife I don't know if Luigi's family was from America I'm not sure um, I just know that they wanted to eventually plan to go to the US they hear it's the place to be for big dreams and a new beginning and basically uh, they're all planning to go to the U.S. at this point as a new family. I'm just kidding. I don't know if that's true. They're planning this trip to the U.S. Ponzi needs money, right? They can't just go with no money. He's taken on the surrogate family. And so he goes to an ex-customer of the bank he worked at. And it's called Canadian Warehousing. I'm assuming it was some kind of warehouse. I don't know what kind. 
but that's what I'm assuming. And so he goes there to look for a job so he, they can start to save money for their trip back to the US. He walks in the building, nobody's there. But you know what is there? A checkbook. This is the thought that goes in through my brain is that he walks in there and he's like, hello, hello, hello. Is anybody here? And there's just this big desk in the middle of the warehouse with a checkbook on it. And he's like, hmm, is anybody here? He starts writing a checkout to himself. It's like, you know that checkbook wasn't just sitting up. He had to probably go look through somebody's office to find that checkbook. So he's like snooping around and sees it, writes himself a check and goes. This guy had a lot of balls because he just did stuff and didn't care. I don't think there was a thought of any repercussion going through his mind. I think he just did whatever he wanted. He actually writes himself a check for $423 and I think it was 53 cents. He just goes about his day like nothing happens. I don't know what that equivalates to today. You know what, let's look it up. Oh shit, okay, so that's about uh, $13,000. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine being a business and you just see this random $13,000 check written out to this random person and you're like, what the fuck, did I write that check? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good chunk of change, Charles. The police go to confront him and he just holds his wrists out for the handcuffs and says guilty. Guilty. Lock me up. Yeah, so it, it's like at that point I think he knew nothing was, you know, he was caught. Okay, it's like he's probably thinking as they took him to jail. Yeah, that was a really stupid idea. I probably shouldn't have done that. So this lands him about three years in prison. I actually read somewhere that he doesn't even tell his family he's in prison he writes a letter to his family and says that he got a job as an assistant to a jail warden so it's like this guy i'm just like how do you get a how do people get away with it like anyways gets out of prison and decides to go back to the u.s i think this was around 1911 so he goes to Atlanta and this is where he comes into this new business of smuggling. He starts smuggling Italian immigrants from Italy into the US and of course he gets caught and he goes right back to prison baby making good choices. The smuggling gets him landed in prison again but he's only in prison now for two years. Eventually he gets out of prison and he goes to Boston. He had spent time in Boston previously and I guess he liked it so he ends up going back and here I read he does a couple of other jobs. He ends up losing them. I think they're kind of irrelevant to be honest for me to even go into them but you know he's just kind of bouncing around from job to job and eventually he meets his lovely lady. Her name was Rose Maria. I'm gonna butcher the last name. Gineco? I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. And it was said that they fell in love like immediately. Like he was smitten by her the moment he met her. And you know, Charles Ponzi wasn't a bad looking guy. He knows his way with words. I'm sure he knew how to finesse the ladies. And can you imagine if you just had this beautiful Italian man like obsessed with you like what woman doesn't want to just be swooned over she falls in love i mean come on you would too wouldn't you they got married very quickly he was not honest with her about his past um she actually didn't know about his previous years in prison he never told her and funny enough his mom actually sent her a letter warning her about her son yeah, his mom is just spilling all the tea about his past, but she didn't care. She was in love with her man. She stood by him and they actually ended up getting married in 1918. Her family actually owned a small fruit stand in downtown Boston. Um, they had this little business going on for them. He works for a couple of different places. None of them really seem to be working out. And then he comes up with this idea that he wants to try to start his own business. Now he wants to start getting into advertising. So he tries to start his own thing doesn't really work out. Um, he tries to sell advertising to larger businesses and this idea is just a huge flop. It completely ends up failing. I'm not trying to be sympathetic to him because he was a big fat scammer and a lot of people lost a lot of money because of him. However, you know, he's trying to walk the straight and narrow and he's probably thinking like, man, I'm trying to be legit and I fail. Time to go back to a life of crime. It's the only logical explanation, right? No. He also does end up taking over his wife's 
uh, family's fruit stand and he ends up tanking that too. Yeah. He just like ran it into the gutter. So I just don't think he's a very good businessman. We're now in 1918. So we're like a good almost 20 years of him just like failing miserably. I don't know. I think he just needed to do something different. So yeah, kind of sucks, but it happened. You know, what are you going to do? You got to move on. He starts this new venture where he wants to sell um, business ideas to places in Europe. He actually ends up getting a response from a company in Spain asking about an advertising, an advertising catalog which had an IRC on it. Now, if you don't know what an IRC is, don't worry. I didn't know either. <laughs> We're going to learn together. An IRC stands for an inter international reply coupon and it is a type of voucher accepted in various other countries in exchange for local postage stamps. The way that he would profit from these IRCs was that he realized he could buy them in another country for way cheaper than what they were worth in the US. So he could buy them for really cheap in Italy and then sell them for a profit in the US. So he would make that extra profit from the difference in currencies. I also learned that that's what arbitrage is. I don't know. I've heard that word before, but I didn't know what it was. Hansi actually ended up saying later on that this profit was like a 400% markup, which is insane if you think about it. So this guy is seeing dollar signs. I mean, let's just be honest. This is his new business plan. He wants to buy all of these really cheap IRCs in other countries and then make the profit in the US because they're worth more in the US. But he needs money to do this. Well, he doesn't have the money. Surprise, surprise. So he tries to go to all these banks. He looks for investors. He's looking for funding. The banks flat out turn him down. They're like, absolutely not. We are not, you know, just ke also keep in mind, this is right after a world war. So, you know, money wasn't really like floating about. It's like they just got out of this huge war. The country's kind of recovering. And basically the banks tell him no. They're like, look, it's not gonna work out. You gotta go somewhere else to get your money because they just weren't convinced. He essentially swindles some of his friends into being investors and loaning him the money. Yep, he did that. He basically promises his investors that he can double their money in just 90 days. These people loan him so much money. I mean, we'll get into the numbers in just a bit, but it's a lot. Eventually, he starts telling people that he can promise them a 50% interest in just 45 days. So he's promising even more money, less days. I, mean, I don't know I don't know if he was desperate or what was going through his brain. Also keep in mind this was during a time where banks were only paying a 5% annual interest. So this is 5% a year. Now he's promising like way more than that. I mean a 50% increase in just a couple of short weeks. I'm sure these businessmen were just shitting their pants at the idea of all of this money. Remember what I said earlier, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I'm not like the most financial savvy person. I'm not like a businesswoman, but I'd imagine if somebody came to me and said that to me, I'd be like, it sounds a little too good to be true. I'm gonna pass. In 1920, he actually ends up starting his own company and it's called the Securities Exchange Company. I actually read that the first, I think it was like the first 18 or 20 people that end up investing, he pays them back like this. That leads more and more people to want to invest. So he's getting all these people to, it's like coming in, coming in, coming in, all this money coming in but he can't pay them out in that quickly of amount of time. It's just not possible. He can't deliver what he's promising in that quick of a turnaround time. He starts hiring sales agents and they start recruiting people to invest. Ah, see, recruiting, hint, hint. So they're getting all these people to invest and they just are expecting this big payday. He's making like, like, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a day and he is paying out people but he's not paying out people with the profit he's paying it out with what these new investors are bringing in so say he's got his first 50 investors 
his next 50 are paying the first 50 so he's not actually paying them out with profit and that's what messes him up he just promised too much too quickly and you know it's like he saw money coming in I guess and as a guy who had never really had money and has kind of just struggled to make money his whole life I guess he just got a little greedy in the beginning of his scheme he actually asked people to invest five thousand dollars in just a couple of months people were starting to invest twenty five thousand dollars and so it just kept getting higher and higher he's asking for more and more money a couple months in he eventually starts making like a million dollars a day yeah that's a lot of freaking money. A million dollars a day, can you imagine? A million dollars in 1920 is equivalent to 15 million and 42 thousand dollars today. I think I'd just be giving my money away at that point. It's also said that a lot of his investors weren't even, or at least the ones that he was paying out, they weren't even keeping the profits. They were just taking whatever he was paying them and just reinvesting it, probably and some, because this deal was just too good to be true. A lot of people were just investing like everything they had, their houses, their life savings. I mean, every single penny that they had because it just seemed to be like you couldn't fail. I almost started to feel sorry for Ponzi in some of my research, but now I'm starting to realize he was a real shithead. <laughs> I feel like it got to a point that he was just in too deep and it's like he didn't know how to stop it. You know, it just got too out of control. Another thing I also read, which is really sad, was that a lot of these investors were just like regular middle class, working class people. Eventually word got to like these big, big business people who had, you know, money to lose should their investment go south. So yeah, he eventually gets into that market and he gets these big name, big money people to start investing in his pyramid scheme. I actually read that 75% of the Boston Police Department um, was investing as well. Like 75% of their officers had invested in his scheme. So this was like a big thing. I mean, it was probably like very, very well known in the Boston community because it was like a sure thing that they were going to get their money back. I mean, it just said like people of all jobs, all like walks of life were investing money they had like young kids investing i even read somewhere that like paper boys were investing i mean just everyone although he is paying some people back he's definitely not paying all of them back and he actually has a little problem he hasn't really figured out how to transfer the ircs into u.s currency he couldn't do it he couldn't actually change it to like money, like actual, like physical money to where he could take that money and pay people off. And I think when he had that light bulb moment, he was probably like, oh shit, I am fucked. I read on one website that he would have had to take several Titanic size ships, fill them all up with the IRCs and then get them to the US and figure out a way to transfer them to cash. That's a lot of fucking coupons, dude. During this time, he's like living the life of luxury. Like him and Rose are just living it up. They're living the good life. They bought this huge mansion. They're driving like all these fancy cars, buying all this fancy jewelry and their fancy china. I'm sure having lavish dinner parties. I can only imagine what kind of lifestyle they were living some time goes by and people eventually start to get suspicious of him and they're not getting their money back and they're kind of wondering like hey when are you gonna pay us back you know you paid out these other people we have invested a lot of money into you and we want to see our return like you promised us 45 days we want to see it so there was actually um a financial reporter who wrote a story on him saying that there was no way he was going to be able to pay these people back that he was like so skeptical and it just like there was no way financially that he could do it ponzi actually ends up suing this guy and winning i think he won it was either a hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars i can't remember now but he he won like a decent amount of money and the guy was right like he shouldn't have 
he shouldn't have had to pay him because he was actually right. After he won that case against him, um, people's doubts kind of started to go away. Like they had faith in him again and they kind of stopped questioning him because he won his libel case against that writer. The Boston Post actually ended, ended up writing an article about him. They did like this really favorable article on him and his business and how well he was doing and crazy enough this brought in even more investors. So he was actually able to pay back a lot of people because he was getting even more investors than ever, if you can even believe that. It's actually said that the day after the article posted, um, he walked into his office the next morning and thousands and thousands of people were lined up, waiting in line to just invest with him. I mean, if you think about the numbers, it's great. This is why I love history, because I think about things like this and I'm like, how did this actually happen? It's just fascinating to me. There was a financial journalist at the time named Clarence Barron. It almost seems like he tried to make the downfall of Ponzi his personal mission, which he probably deserved. I mean, he did deserve it, let's be honest. He actually discovered that in order for Ponzi to be paying out this type of money with these types of numbers, there would have had to be 160 million IRC coupons in the world's circulation. And there wasn't because the post office actually ended up saying that there was only 27,000 in circulation. So this just blew the top off the kettle. Is that the saying? Rightfully, people started to shit their pants. I mean, there was just mass panic. People were like, again, lined up outside his office demanding money. Like they wanted their money immediately. They finally were calling him out on his bullshit. Ponzi starts freaking out. I think he realized that this was coming to an end. However, he was trying to salvage it as much as he could. And he actually ends up paying out, I think it was $2 million in about the span of three days to kind of calm people's nerves and kind of get them to stop freaking out so much. So he ends up paying out this money because he wants to just kind of get people to calm down. He is able to calm people down. However, he picks up the eye of the U.S. District Attorney at the time. His name was Daniel Gallagher and he was the U.S. District Attorney of Massachusetts. I can never pronounce that state. He actually starts auditing his books and this is where it starts to go down. Apparently his books were just like a mess. He didn't have any real bookkeeping system. It was just things like scribbled down on index cards. I mean, it was just like a complete disaster. So it was really hard for them to audit his books. However, he is being watched by the district attorney. So now he's on their radar and now I'm sure he's like, I'm fucked. He even tries to hire a publicist during this time to do a little bit of damage control and the publicist saw right through him. He basically told him he was an idiot and there's no way that this investment was legit and it's just like the cat's out of the bag. Like anything he's doing now, it's not working. Um, people are just starting to see right through him and rightfully so because he was a scammer and he deserves, he deserves everything that happens to him. After the audit is complete, they actually find that he is $7 million in debt. There was another article that actually came out about him and this is what said to just completely bring him down. Um, it basically was just an article unraveling his entire past, uh, the jail time he did in Montreal, all his swindling that he's done, and this big, I think it was like an 11 page article, something like that. And this was like the end, you know, at this point people, they finally saw him for what he really was. He gets arrested by the, I think I read the FBI arrested him, so this is like a federal case now. Um, he ends up getting arrested and I think he just like went, you know, like what's he gonna do? <laughs> he was like, just take me. He was released and then he was just immediately rearrested for larceny. <laughs> God, it must have sucked to been him at that time, right? At the time of his arrest, his investors lost about $20 million. In today's currency, it equals about $300 million. He was actually charged with 86 counts of mail fraud and basically faced 
life in prison. His wife was actually the one who urged him to just take the guilty sentence and he did and he actually ended up only getting five years in prison. And almost immediately he was indicted with 22 counts of larceny. This was brought on by the state of Massachusetts. So um, I think he tried to fight it. It actually went to the Supreme Court, I think I read. And he said that he was, it wasn't fair because he was being charged with double jeopardy. Um, but the Supreme Court didn't agree with him because one was a federal case and one was the actual state of Massachusetts. <laughs> so he ended up going to court for that too. And again, he got sentenced to prison. And this time he was in prison for seven and a half years. In 1925, he was released from prison. He ends up fleeing Boston and going down to Florida. And in Florida, he tries to do the same thing. Professional swindler. He does some stupid like investment scheme, which thankfully doesn't end up working out. And um, he actually gets arrested by the Florida police because that's what he does best. And he ends up getting convicted. However, his conviction gets overturned. After that, he ends up going down to a different city in Florida. I think I read it was Tampa. He tries to change his appearance. He shaves all of his hair off. I think I read he grew out a mustache or something. And he actually tries to flee out of the country on a ship, trying to get back to the motherland, Italy. And uh, one of the crewmen recognizes who he is somehow or another. And he actually ends up getting arrested because remember, he's not on bond. He wasn't actually, like he didn't actually serve out his sentence. The crewman totally turned him in. He was like, fuck this guy. And rightfully so. Um, so yeah, he actually gets shipped right back up to Boston and serves out another seven years of prison. Eventually he's released in 1934. When he gets released from prison, he actually ends up getting deported back to Italy. They said, fuck this guy. We don't even want you in our country. His wife actually ends up divorcing him because she does want to leave Boston. She wants to stay with her family and her home and they end up getting divorced. He gets deported back to Italy where he tries to live out all these other little scammy things that aren't even worth mentioning. They don't work out. Nothing ever follows through. Um, he actually has like really bad deteriorating health at this point and he ends up having a massive heart attack, ends up getting a stroke. I think it paralyzes like part of his body. So he's just like, it's, he's really like, his health is just really deteriorating at this point. He's doing really bad. And honestly, I say what goes around comes around. I mean, sorry. It just, I said what I said. He basically just like lived in shambles. He had no money, uh, no family, nothing. Like he literally had one friend left. While he was on his deathbed, did one last interview, um, with the help of this friend. I'm gonna read you guys the quote, okay? Even if they never got anything for it, it was cheap at that price. Without malice, a forethought, I had given them the best show that was ever staged in their territory since the landing of the pilgrims. It was easily worth 15 million bucks to watch me put the thing over. Clearly this guy has no fucking remorse for what he did to anybody. So yeah, anyways, uh, that was pretty much it. He ends up dying in a, uh, I think I read it was a Brazil charity hospital. He ends up dying. He was only 66 when he died, um, which my grandma's in her 70s. So yeah, I don't really think that that's that old. He just had a lot of health issues and honestly, I think it was karma and I think he deserved it. And that is the story of the origination of the pyramid scheme. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sitting and listening to me today. Let me know what else you guys want to see in the comments below. Leave me any suggestions, anything you want me to talk about. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.